and uh, it's really nice to be here. We have been really enjoying the fresh air uh, and the coolness of the air. Um, in Oklahoma right now, it's probably something like 38 degrees centigrade, and um, it's nice to look out through the windows over there, but it's a bit more difficult to venture into it. Um, so it's very nice to breathe some fresh air and look at the uh, beautiful uh, birds, the tuis and the rosellas and all the other uh, nice wildlife that we have around uh, the Auckland area. Let us pray. Our God and Father, we thank Thee for this time we have got together to, to meet, uh, to share the Word of God, to learn once more the wonderful truths of life, and particularly, Lord, that as we seek to understand Thy economy, which is now, and uh, to do so to get better acquainted with Thee and, and Thy will in this age. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Now, uh, we are gathered here around the scriptures, and I must apologize for, for some of you, perhaps, who have come here for the first time, because uh, this is more, more or less a graduate course in Christian understanding of the Bible. And I believe that this is important. We shouldn't just talk about the milk of the word. We must also move people forward and take them on unto perfection by bringing out the meat of the word also. And so my apology is only for those who uh, perhaps have not been here before, but there's no apology about preaching the word of God rightly divided, none whatsoever, because we believe this is absolutely essential. And as is my custom, I like to do a brief summary, while sometimes it's not so brief. And I've got to watch that, but um, this time I'll try and make it a little bit uh, briefer. Um, last time we looked at this idea that's presented in the book of 1 Corinthians, especially chapter 11, where you get not only commandment, but you get tradi tradition added together to form something which the Bible in the King James refers to as an ordinance, which is simply a tradition. And we can tell that, for example, in the Lord's Supper, where we have basically the Passover being remembered, but something else has been added to it, and the Lord used this to bring out truths about the fact of His sacrifice, His shedding of His blood, uh, in terms of the new covenant, which was given to Israel. And so what you find here, and I'll use my mouse pointer to, to point around here, you can see the Lord's Supper is made up of two components. One, the Passover, and the other, this cup of blessing, which is one of four cups. And you can read about this in the Jewish tradition recorded in the Mishnah, the Mishnah Pesach, chapter 10. You can read about it, and sure enough, the Jews did remember this. And this picture here really rep represents a lot of things about the importance of right division. Right division. 2 Timothy 2 verse 15, where it talks about how you should study and show yourself approved under God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Without understanding the book of Acts and the fact that there is a major division at the end of the book of Acts, then without that, what you end up with is a conglomerate. We went out to um, Bethel's beach. Tehenga is the beach as it's called by the Maori. And we went out there and there are all these boulders. And if you look at the structure, there's all kinds of layers of structure put down there. Uh, but one of the layers is a conglomerate layer. And the conglomerate layer, it has all these different types of boulders, different size, all mixed together, but nonetheless sealed together solidly as a stratum. And you can see it all there. And, you know, without Acts 28, basically what you've got is a conglomerate, just a mix of all kinds of things. And one of the things you get without Acts 28 right division, is kind of an admixture of traditions and ideas that relate to Israel. And there's nothing wrong with Israel, but we need to understand what is God, what is God doing today. 
Who is he speaking to today? And what has he said? How do we understand what God's will is for us in this particular age? If we want to understand what God's will is in the past age, well, we can do it. We can go back into the book of Acts and we can read about what God did in the past age. We can see exactly what went down. But here is the key. And this key, I think, is something that people never told me when I first got saved. And I truly got saved without understanding right division. Here's the point I want you to understand. Here at this church, we don't teach that unless you believe exactly as we teach, then you're lost. We don't teach that. We do not believe that. We believe that a person is saved by grace. It's a free gift of God based upon the finished work of Christ. That's how you get saved. But our question, our question which we're trying to address is, well, what about after that? What is the Christian's responsibility after they're saved? Well, the scriptures say that we should go on unto perfection. We shouldn't go back unto perdition. We should go forward. We need to go forward and understand what God's will is today. So, this is something that no one told me when I first got saved. And basically, it's this idea that if I was to represent here the book of Acts, which traverses it 28 chapters. And there's all sorts of remarkable things that happen, which we, we won't go into, into great detail, but there's certainly the, the record of the giving of, of the Holy Spirit. Some important chapters, like chapter 9, where you read about Paul's uh, conversion on the road to Damascus. And then there's a whole lot of very interesting chapters where you find various incidences where Israel blasphemes, that is, in a local, locality, in a spe specific locality, you find synagogues there where the, the Jews will reject the message of God. Until finally you get to the last chapter, Acts 28 and verse 28, where the salvation of God is sent to the Gentiles. Hey, one thing nice about the Bible, it's really easy to identify your group because there's only two groups. <laughs> there's only two groups. There's the Jews and there's the Gentiles. Now, when I say groups, I'm talking about their national standing. Now, there's the Church of God, which relates to people who get saved and, and come to a knowledge of Christ. But as far as nationalities, there's the nations, and they're just grouped together, and they're called the Gentiles. And then there's the nation of Israel. Well, I'm looking out here, I'm looking at you people, and I'm saying, hmm, Samoans, uh, British descendants, uh, Dutch descendants, um, New A descendants, uh, you know. I'm seeing Gentiles, man. Hello, Gentiles. How are you doing? Looks like what we need to understand is, what is the message uniquely given to us as Gentiles today? And we'll find Gentiles mentioned back here, but there's one big difference. And that is that the Gentiles back here were grafted in to the olive of Israel. So here's this, this graft, which the scriptures say is an unnatural graft. And these Gentiles were grafted in contrary to nature to provoke Israel to jealousy. So during this time, it was Jew first. So during the book of Acts, it's you first. And that's the economy. It has to do with Israel. The hope of Israel. That's what dominates this time, where God is giving an advantage to the nation of Israel. Oh, well, that's different to us Gentiles then, isn't it? The Gentiles back here are not first. But when we come over to the boundary... Acts 28, 28, it says the salvation of God is sent to the Gentiles in this context after it had been sent to the Jew first. So in this context where Israel is judged, now we get the salvation of God sent to the Gentiles, not Jew first. Very different situation. That's the age in which we live. Now here comes the big deal. This now is the big deal. During this time... 
there were epistles written by Paul. Paul, yes. And he wrote epistles during this time. Certainly six, and I believe seven, if you include Hebrews. So, if you look at the epistles written this time, and during this time, you'll find, for example, Romans. Romans. That is a very important book. Why is that a very important book? Well, because this book talks about how to get out of one man and into another. And you'll notice, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six letters in Romans. Six. Hmm, the number of man. And let's see, do we see a man in there? Yeah, we see a man in there. Romance. And then if we go to chapter 6, verse 6, and then we go to the sixth word, I wonder, can someone look that up for me please? And by the way, could someone tell me which book in the Bible is Romans. Which number? I mean, Matthew, Mark. Which book is that? One, two, three. Go through it. Tell me what Romans is. Where does it come? The what book? The sixth book. Oh, the sixth book. Six letters. Man in, the, in there. Six, the number of man. And we go to the sixth chapter. And then we go to the sixth verse. And then we... Go across to the sixth word. What is it? Man. Oh, this is just by accident. It's just a little accident there. What we have is quite an amazing book. It's not like any other book. It's being designed. And what we need to do is discover these things that are written and kept and preserved for us. Okay, well this is not the main message, that, but we're going to come back to Romans. That's why I'm mentioning it here, because we're going to come back to Romans. Something kind of important happens in Romans. So, what we have is all these epistles written by Paul. Well, if Paul wrote Romans in the book of Acts during that time, then it must represent the same doctrine that we find in the book of Acts. Does that make sense to you? If this time period relates to Jew first, if it relates to the hope of Israel, if the economy here relates to Israel first, the new covenant given to Israel, and these traditions and all these other things, then surely it must be the case that the books written during that time would also represent the same teaching. Well... Let's just have a quick look at Romans, just to sort of make sure you see the point I'm making here. Just have a look at Romans chapter number 1. See, this is dangerous for me to be doing this, because already I'm beginning a rabbit trail, which is now departing from what I had prepared for you. But this is typical. I think the Spirit of God is in it. Let's have a look at Romans chapter number 1 and verse number 16. Look at this passage with me. Right? Just think about the logic of what I'm saying to you. Do you believe that God is logical? Do you think that God is irrational? Do you think God is a completely rational being that is logical, makes sense? See, I believe he makes sense. So I believe God's word is going to make sense. Now, when I first got saved, because of the messages coming through the pulpit, and here I am, I'm expecting to hear sense from God, but the person in the pulpit did not tell me these things, I could not make sense out of the Bible. I could not make sense out of it. I knew there was something wrong and I was searching for the answers. Now look at Romans chapter number 1, verse 16 and 17. It says this, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God unto salvation. Yep, that's great and that's true. That's true today. It is the power of God unto salvation. Now look at the next word. To everyone that believeth, great, yes. Right on, man. Then he carries on. To the Jew first. Well, hold the phone. Now we're beginning to see this clear doctrinal position of the Acts period. We're now starting to see the book of Romans is indeed 
representing and is conforming to the doctrine we find in the book of Acts. It's, there's no surprise. And it says, and also to the Greek, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. And then it says, as it is written. Oh, here is another thing that you'll find true of all the Acts period books. And same with the book of Acts. What's going on here is based upon what is written. That is, the Old Testament scriptures given to the nation of Israel. What you find going on here is prophetical. Prophetical. Based upon Israel. Why aren't I majoring all my time, like many ministers do, on things to come concerning the book of Daniel, concerning the book of Revelation? I don't do that because I want to first of all understand how I'm supposed to live today. Now I am interested in what's going to happen with Israel. That's good and an important thing. But isn't it first of all our responsibility to find out what God has us to do today? Right? Now you can get your ears tickled with all sorts of nice possibilities about what's going to happen with the nation of Israel in the future, but what I want to know is today. I want to be right up in step with God. So that's important to see. This is the Jew first, what's written. You say, well, what about the hope? Okay, follow this. Romans. We'll stick in Romans. Let's go across to Romans chapter number 15. Romans chapter 15. In verse 8. Romans 15 verse 8. Cool, let's have a look at it. It says this. Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. To confirm the promises made unto the fathers. And what was Paul doing here in the book of Romans and during the book of Acts, while he was saying none of the things and what Moses and the prophets said should come. That's what he said. Read about that in the book of Acts, chapter 26. Yes, that's what's going on here. Now look at this as we go on further down. And he says, and that the Gentiles. Oh, now he's mentioning a group of people that would include us if we were in the book of Acts, it would include us. If we were living during the time of the book of Acts, this is our message. The question I have for you right now is, are you living in the time of the book of Acts? Or are you living after it? After a certain judgment has come on Israel? And it says, and that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. As it is written, oh, now here it comes, as it is written. What was the hope being promised to the Gentiles here? It's a written hope. It's not a secret hope. It's a part of the hope of Israel. Carry on reading. For this cause I will confess to thee among the Gentiles and sing unto thy name. And again he saith, Rejoice ye Gentiles with his people. Israel. What's the context? Jew first. Unnatural graft. Partaking of the root and the fatness of the olive tree. Israel. Get it? Are you getting this? Are you understanding what's going on here? This is not introductory ABCs. This is now getting into some deeper matters to do with the word of God. But they're important for you to grow on. And it says this uh, in verse 11. And again, praise the Lord, all ye Gentiles. And Lord him, all ye people. Again, Israel. And again, Isaiah saith, There shall be a root of Jesse, and he that shall rise to reign over the Gentiles. In him shall the Gentiles trust. Oh, wait. Isaiah saith. That's the prophet Isaiah. The hope that's presented here for the Gentiles is the hope that Isaiah preached about and was recorded in the book of Isaiah in the Old Testament. What is the hope then? It's the hope of Israel. <laughs> you see? It's the hope that has to do with the millennial reign and all the things that are going to happen on this earth through a redeemed Israel. Carrying on, it says, Now the God of hope. What hope? The God of hope. What hope? It's the 
that hope, the hope that's just been presented, the hope of Israel, the hope that Isaiah presented, the hope where it, Gentiles were partaking of the spiritual things of Israel. Now hold on. If you as Gentiles, who were, you know, like the dogs, eating of the crumbs that fall from the master's table, if you're partaking of these wonderful things that come not directly to you, but to the nation of Israel, and you're getting in on the side, as it were, you know, you're getting in not because God is dealing directly with you, but because he's using you to provoke Israel, how should you relate to God and to Israel? Well, just, just take this passage with me. Now, if you come down a little bit further, uh, it says this in Romans 15 and verse uh, 19. Through mighty signs, this is verse 19, through mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and round about unto Illyricum, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. Oh, so how did he fully preach the gospel of Christ? Well, he did so by an inclusion of all these miraculous things, right? Signs and wonders. What do you find in the book of Acts? Signs and wonders going on. What am I teaching you? I am teaching you this basic truth that what Paul writes in his Acts epistles does indeed conform to the Acts period. That's what he's doing. This time when Israel was first. And there's some tremendous passages that I, I would like to bring out in here, but I, I need to keep to my routine, otherwise I'm going to uh, spend too much time on this. Uh, just come down here, I want to bring this out, one more point. In verse 26 it says this, uh, For it hath pleased them of Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution for the poor saints which are at Jerusalem. Contribution here is actually a fellowship. They embodied their fellowship with this contribution. And it says, for the poor saints at, which are at Jerusalem. Why? Why did they do that? Because they were partaking of Israel's spiritual things and therefore they had a responsibility to manage and look after Israel in a carnal sense. When they had need. It was their responsible, responsibility to look after them. It says this in verse 27, It hath pleased them verily, and their debtors they are. For if the Gentiles underline this passage, this passage is a passage which is completely ignored by people. It says, For if the Gentiles, that's the Gentiles in the book of Acts, have been made partakers of their spiritual things, their duty is also to minister unto them in carnal things. That's why it was their responsibility to embody their fellowship, the thing that they had in common, with a contribution, which is the same word, fellowship. They materialized their fellowship in some way. They materialized their fellowship with a contribution, this carnal thing, which they would then give to the poor saints at Jerusalem. Why? Because they were partaking of Israel's spiritual things. Right? Now, if you don't rightly divide the word of truth, and you do not see that this came to an end, then of course what you'll have to do is start up ministries to the nation of Israel. You will need to give them a preference. You need to let the Jew be first. You say, right division doesn't matter. Well, here again, don't you think this matters? It changes how you live your life as a Christian. Okay, well, we also looked at this business of fellowship. Well, I can go on about the book of Romans. There's lots in there. But in, in here, this word fellowship, and I looked at this stem word coin last time uh, of the word fellowship, koinonia, and you notice that what it comes up with first, the first passage, Matthew 15, 11, not that which goeth into the mouth defileth a man, that is, makes common. You see, defileth a man. But that which cometh out of the mouth, this defileth a man. Doesn't this come right down to the root of everything? And what 
you get in terms of shadow and reality, shadow and reality, you can find Jesus bringing this up. And the last case is in Revelation 21, 27, and there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither what sort of work at the abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. Defileth, same idea, defiling, make common. The idea that I want you to think about is that if you bring which is sacred and specific and then you try and make it common, it's like defiling. It's like something that will defile you. What people do is they take the thing which is specific, the mystery, for example, the mystery, which was hidden God, and they say, oh no, let's make that common. It's, it's not anything unique, and this age over here is nothing unique, and they defile it. They make it common, they destroy the particular fellowship that God has created, did not evolve. No, he created it. And therefore there is no evolution in the context. So there's some important things. And we went through a lot of passages uh, about this. So the fellowship here, the idea, and I would not that you should have fellowship with devils. See, the idea of a stumbling block is that, all right, uh, you shouldn't do anything that would stumble someone. You know, if you had someone you're trying to reach, why stumble that person simply by eating pork when this person thinks that pork is, you know, it's no good and it's an abomination, you shouldn't have it. Uh, why stumble it? Even though we know that there's no big deal with eating pork. Every creature of God is good and nothing to be, you know, put aside. It's been cleansed. So, what that teaching comes up is that in this context, I would not that you should have fellowship with devils, means this. If you eat food that has been sacrificed to idols, that's no big deal. But if you are partaking of the devil's table, that is, you are really saying there is something common in common with the devils in your belief, then that is a complete abomination. The idea is there comes a time when you must take a stand. You must say, no, wait, there is a difference. There is a distinct fellowship here. And we read about that in Ephesians. Have a look at this with me. And this is just recapping from last time and then I'm going to move on to something more. Look at Ephesians chapter number 3. So when we go to Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 9, what are we doing? We are moving out of the book of Acts. We're now coming over here and we are reading material which was given to Paul the prisoner for us in this age. So we have jumped the great divide. Okay, we have jumped the great divide. Now Paul says this. He says, And make all men see what is the fellowship, the thing that makes common, of the mystery which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things in Christ Jesus. Okay, so here is the fellowship of the mystery. Okay, and it's hid in God. This, this mystery was hid in God. Very important thing. A nice question we should ask ourselves is, how do we materialize this fellowship? In what ways can we materialize this fellowship. I mean, past Christians and other ages, they made a, a contribution. They materialized this. It became the fellowship, the contribution. It's actually the same word. Well, in what ways can we materialize this and bring it out in our midst? Well, one thing we can do is we can hold fast to the unity of the Spirit which God had created, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit. And people can see something different about this, this fellowship, that it's knit together. And people will see, oh, wait a minute, this fellowship is not under bondage to traditions. And it's different to any other type of fellowship that we've seen. That's materializing this. Now, that's not what this word means 
directly in this context, the fellowship of the mystery here has to do with those spiritual things that have to, to do with the mystery which are in common. I and mean, we can materialize that as a fellowship in various ways. Okay, and this picture, of course, I showed you. Uh, unfortunately, what people are doing today is they've got a boot in both camps and they want their cake and eat it as well, you know. Basically, what they, they're trying to do is they're trying to resurrect the signs and the wonders. They're trying to resurrect various baptisms. They're trying to resurrect the Lord's Supper. They're trying to get themselves into the new covenant, which was given to the nation of Israel. And they're trying to do all these things. They're trying to embody all these ordinances, these traditions. And that is how they make their religion. And they'll try and put their boot into both camp. Won't work. We talk about the snohushta and the piece of brass. It's exactly the sort of thing that's going on today. So today what I want to do is I want to concentrate your attention on a passage. And we're going to take this whole thing a whole step further. Now, I want you to go to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter number 10 in your Bible. And look at verse number 11. Look what it says. Now all these things happened unto them for ensamples. All these things. Well, if you just go back, what does it talk about? Well, in, in chapter 10, it says in verse 1, Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant, how that all our fathers, all our fathers, who are they? That's the fathers of the nation of Israel. <clears throat> Remember I was talking about this whole deal about Romans and in Romans what we find, we find the hope of Israel, we find, we find all, everything related to the, what was written. The hope presented here was Isaiah's hope. We find all those things to do with the nation of Israel. And now when we go to 1 Corinthians, what do we find? Well, we find again Israel present. Why is Israel present? Because 1 Corinthians is an axe epistle. So it's now going to regather and reteach Ideas which have been promoted in the book of Acts. Same context. And it says, and verse 2, and were all baptized unto Moses. Oh, here's a baptism. They were all baptized unto Moses. There's a person, there's a baptism, and it goes on. In the cloud and in the sea, and did all eat the same spiritual meat, and did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock. That followed them and that rock was Christ. Now we understand that Christ was there in the Old Testament and that followed Israel and they partook. But with many of them, God was not well pleased. Okay, so here comes judgment on them. Now in verse number uh, 11, it says this, Now all these things happened unto them for in samples and they were written for our admonition upon whom, now look at this, the ends of the world... I come. I want you to be paying attention to this expression. Ace hus tatele ton ionon keten tason. Upon whom the ends of the ages have arrived. Upon whom the ends of the ages have arrived. Now I'm going to diagram this a little bit soon. But first of all, I want you to look at this verb, and I've put it in red here. And I'm going to, I won't, we won't go through all these passages, you can do that, but I want you to go to these last two, Ephesians chapter 4, since these are post-Acts uh, passages. Let's have a look at them. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 13. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man under the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Now it says here, till we all come, there it is, that's the verb, till we all come, till we all reach that unity. Well, right then it hadn't occurred, but that was the prospect, till we all come to this. What does Paul want? He wants unity. We're talking about how we should materialize the fellowship. Well, one way is to make this unity, right, and keep it in a practical sense. And he goes on. And it says that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie and wait to deceive. Wow! 
That's a strong passage, isn't it? Because it infers and implies that there are people that are waiting around with false doctrine, trying to ensnare people. And we'll, we'll look at this word, word ensnare. But do you notice also the context, till we all come, that's the verb, till we all come in the unity of the faith? In this context, what is it? Well, it says this in verse 11, And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Well, here are some gifts that were given concerning this whole business of how people are to be helped along the way. These are gifts. Pastors and teachers. You've got evangelists, pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. And that's what helped me. Uh, I, when I first got saved, as I said, I... I didn't understand all these things about right division. But what happened was, because I was seeking and because I was open, various preachers came my way by tracks, by audios, by whatever, all sorts of books. And progressively things started to unfold for me. And I began to understand these things. Go across to the book of Philippians chapter 3. And verse number 11, and it says this, <clears throat> chapter 3, If by any means I might attain, I might attain. Well, what's he saying there? He, this is put in prospect. It means that he is looking forward to that time that he would attain to this. And notice the, the wording, if by any means. If by any means implies that there is the possibility that he could fail if by any means I might attain unto the res resurrection of the dead. What are you telling me? That Paul thought he, he could be lost? He might be lost there? No! No, I'm not. You know why? Because this resurrection here is a special resurrection. This resurrection is called the ex anastasis. It's the ex anastasis. It's the out. You know, you've seen ex and exit. Exit, the way out. Okay, anastasis, resurrection. The out resurrection. That's what he was looking forward to. A special one which is given on the base, basis of you perfecting your your faith with good deeds on the basis of rewards for good service. That's what he was saying. And that was not certain. There's nothing certain about that particular resurrection. It's something you have to earn. Life is a gift, but rewards come through good service. Right? That's what that's about. But notice here, if by any means I might attain, it's out in the future. Okay, now that's, that's interesting, I suppose. So go across now to another passage. So I want to just pull some threads together. Because this expression that comes up in 1 Corinthians concerning the ends of the ages, what on earth is that about? Well, this is something that comes up again here in Hebrews 9.26, and you can look at it with me. Uh, it says this, for then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. Well, isn't that interesting? How, isn't it interesting how very, very key words come up in the same context? The foundation of the world. That is a very important thing that comes up. Uh, but now once, hapax, in the end of the world, hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Now look at, I've, I've sort of, put here in the Greek text here, I've put here in red. But now, once, upon the suntalia, the, the gathering in of the ages, the gathering in of the age, once, in the gathering in of the ages, that word, suntalia, it ap appears here. And these passages, these are the only passages where you'll find it. And it's very instructive just to read. We'll just read the first one, Matthew 13. Let's go there and find Matthew 13 and see what we can learn from it. 
Matthew 13 is interesting. 13 is a, is a number which is associated with rebellion, isn't it? Teenagers? What's their first teenage year? 13, right? Doesn't mean to say that all teenagers will be rebellious, but generally speaking, there's a good, good evidence to support the idea that there is a, you know, a good opportunity for teenagers to express rebellion in their teenage years. Uh, Matthew 13 and verse 39. And it says this. Uh, we can read up a little bit before then. We'll read from verse 37. He answered and said unto them, this is Matthew chapter 13, verse 37. He answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. But the tears are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil, and the harvest, the harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. The harvest, the harvest, that's the Suntalaya. That's the gathering in, which is associated with the end of the ages. Hmm, interesting here. Another thing that you might notice um, just go back to the, the passage that we were looking at. Um, uh, actually, I'll skip forward just a little bit and I'll go back to that previous one. If you look at this expression, uh, the ends of the ages, how would you diagram it? How would you diagram the ends of the ages? Well, during this period of time, which I would include also the sacrifice of Christ, extending into it, you find the ends of the ages coming. In other words... The ends of the ages were to culminate in the fulfillment of prophecy, right? If you look at the ages, the prophetical ages, they talked about this coming time of the Messiah when this great kingdom would be placed on the earth. Well, the Acts age included, of course, the, we're going to include the, the Christ sacrifice, uh, the ends of the ages came in on this time. It was a unique time. If I diagrammed a little bit further, I could put this. Here is the axe where the ends, the ends of the ages had arrived. It wasn't in prospect. Remember I showed you those other passages where you could see that, that verb could mean, well, in some time in the future could happen. Not in this case. No, no, it had arrived. It had come. The ends of the ages had arrived in the book of Acts and was starting to be fulfilled. The things were starting to happen. Joel's prophecy was beginning to come true with the signs and the wonders. All those things were beginning to happen. Miraculous things. Now, when you get to the end of the book of Acts, salvation of God is sent to the Gentiles, you find that something new was given to Paul the prisoner. In other words, the ends of the ages were, were progressing, but all of a sudden they stopped. Why did they stop? Why didn't God bring all of the promises to fruition? The reason is because those promises were contingent on the repentance of Israel. And Israel did not repent. They wouldn't repent. And what did God do? He said, okay, bang, salvation of God sent to the Gentiles. And he started something new. Now let's just back up a little bit. Notice in that context, there was this business of the foundation of the world. It came up in the same context. The foundation of the world. Here I've got the expression... Apo, from the foundation of the world. Catabole, catabole. You know, a catabolic process is something which is a destructive process, breaking down, right? Catabolic. Okay, Matthew 13, 35, going all down to Revelation. Seven occurrences. From the foundation of the world. So way back here is the foundation, right? The foundation of the world. Now from the foundation is there, wouldn't it? If I wanted to diagram it, I mean, 
Hey, I like to diagram things. It just makes things more obvious. From the foundation would be like this, wouldn't it? From. Here's from. Those seven references. From the foundation of the world. What do you notice about those references without, without any other you know, sort of thought about it? Well, if you look at them, certainly they have to do with Israel. Look at Matthew 13. Let's just look at that one, since we're pretty close to it. Look at Matthew 13 and verse 35. This is the parable section. Matthew 13 is where the parables are introduced. Well, wh why were they introduced? Okay, look, 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 I'll just, let's just have a look at verse 10, because it's important. And the disciples came and said unto them, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? Why do you speak to them in parables, Lord? Why are you doing that? Well, this is a good question. I want to know the answer to that question. Why is he speaking in parables? Is it because, well, the little kiddies, they need some bedtime stories. That's why. Kiddies need bedtime stories. That's why we've got parables. No. That's not what it says. Look what it says. He answered and said unto them, Because it's given unto you to know the mysteries. Mysteries comes up. The word mysteries comes up in the context of rebellion of Israel. Mysteries. In that context. It goes on. Of the kingdom of heaven. Oh, the kingdom of heaven. That's got to do with Israel's spiritual food. Israel's spiritual promises. But to them it's not given. Okay, so now we've got two groups. One group, it's given to know these things. And another group, it's not given for them to know. Right? And then he quotes Isaiah's passage. Look what he does. He says in verse 12, For whosoever hath to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not from him shall be taken away even that he hath. What's that? That's the principle of the economy, isn't it? Isn't that the principle of the economy we've started with? So the principle of the economy comes up here. Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they seeing see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of who? Isaiah. Isaiah. Which saith, by hearing shall hear and shall not understand, and seeing shall see and, and shall not perceive. And off it goes about the heart. This people, Israel. It's talking about Israel. Read the next verse. All about Israel. Hey, what about that passage? That passage is repeated, isn't it? You know, look at this. Look at Acts 28. Go across to Acts 28 with me, please. And just compare. Okay? Acts chapter 28. And let's read verse number 25. And when they agreed not among themselves, who's this? Who didn't agree? The nation of Israel representatives. When Israel, the elders from Israel, when they would not agree amongst themselves, they departed. After that Paul had spoken one word, well spake the Holy Ghost by Isaiah the prophet unto our fathers. Bingo! This is the final reference to this passage, judgment finally coming on Israel. You getting the idea? This is what's going on. So back here in Matthew, yes, there's a partial blinding, and some of them, two groups, right? But God is still dealing with Israel and still going after them and trying to provoke them to jealousy during the book of Acts. But finally, bang! The last quotation from the book of Isaiah chapter 6, and whammo! Slammed, they are divorced at the end of the book of Acts. In fact, that departed there means a divorce. So it's very interesting. So we can go through these passages, which we have not time, but you can do it. But let's look at verse 35 before I uh, forget to do so. It says this in Matthew 13, 35, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter uh, things which have been kept secret from the catabole, the foundation of the world. From the foundation of the world. What's all this to do with? It's got to do with a ministry which was purposed from the foundation of the world. Okay? 
Well, the other passages on the right have to do with, an, with another preposition, pro, before. Before. So now, if I wanted to diagram before, wouldn't I have to do that? Do you think if I was going to diagram it, I should put it here and put that before there? You know, in other words, you know, from and before is the same idea? I don't think so. <laughs> you know, I don't think so, right? Before and from, very different prepositional ideas. Before the foundation of the world. There was a special love within the Trinity. Before the foundation of the world. That's what John 17, 1 Peter talks about. But look what's right in the middle. Ephesians 1, verse 4. Look at this. Ephesians chapter number 1 and verse 4. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4 says this. According as he hath chosen us in him, this is speaking to whom? Us, by extension, from the Ephesians, in this age. Okay? According as he hath chosen us, you guys, now we can be direct. We can now talk about directly, you guys, me. In him, before the foundation, before this event here. Now, if we have more time, we'll try and locate what this event is, what this overthrow is. But before this event, God made choice. God had made a decision that he would gather a group of people together. And that relates to a plan and purpose which Paul calls the mystery. Mystery, not one of the many mysteries, but the mystery hid in God. You getting the idea, my friends? Can you see that the economy is different here than over here? They're very different things. And when you get this, you get pretty excited about it. It's not just me putting it on. <laughs> it really is an exciting thing that changes your life, your Christian life. We know that salvation is by grace. But are we just going to say, we're saved by grace. We're saved by grace. We're saved by grace. We're saved by grace. Are we just going to preach salvation by grace and only that for the rest of our days on this earth? Is that what we do? Is that it? There's no more to the Bible than that. Come on! God is immense. He's infinite. Infinite man. It's got information for us to understand. We should look for that information. And let me tell you, the particular information that comes to us in this age is the, from Paul the prisoner and in those post-Acts epistles. Very important things to see. Uh, important indeed, those things. Uh, up here, I'm pointing to the fact that at rightdivision.com you can get tremendous resources for your understanding of the Bible. Up here, for example, uh, this is just a, a portion of the notes that go along with the videos. So if you go to rightdivision.com, you can find the videos and then you can click on various resources. Teacher's notes, for example. And here are some, some very interesting verses. For example, here, look at this. These passages here show you uh, that during the time of 1 Corinthians and the Acts period, Christ's coming was imminent. It was close by. Very close. And, I mean, we could look at any one of these passages, but look, for example, at 1 John 2.18, for example. Let's look at this. So go across to 1 John. Remember last time we talked about Peter, Cephas, that's Peter, which is Cephas, John, James, and now what are we doing? Well, we're going across to John. So let's find First John. And chapter 2, and verse number uh, 18, it says this. Little children, it is not the last time, just close to it. <laughs> it says, it is the last time. What did Paul say? He says, upon whom the ends of the ages have arrived. Not in prospect, but they had arrived. Right? And what does he say here? What does John say? Does he contradict that notion? Little children. It is the last time. It is. And what's John doing? He's talking about the Acts time. 
It is the last time. Why didn't the last time come to the fruition and produce the millennial kingdom? It didn't do that because Israel did not repent. And God is not going to force them to repent. He's going to have to apply the paddle to their backside. You guys still get whacked at school? No, you don't. Why? Well, politically correct, probably. But, you know, when I went through school, we used to get whacked with a cane on the back end. When you bend over tight so that your backside is, you know, pretty tight with your pants. And some gorilla would come at you with this long cane and give you six of the best. Israel has got to go through the time of Jacob's trouble and it will be spanked hard and it will repent. Finally, it will repent. It will bring forth those fruits and become a nation of priests and will be a nation also involved with uh, preachers. You notice here it says, as you have heard that uh, Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrists whereby we know that it is the last time. Now, the Antichrist hadn't come. There were many Antichrists leading up finally to the Antichrist was in prospect. But the last time was there, right there. Cool? Okay, so these little notes, they will help you a lot. Now, this idea of the mystery. The mystery is a very interesting idea. And what's confusing to many people is the fact, if you look at the word mystery, it does appear through the Bible in lots and lots of places. In fact, here is an exhaustive concordance of all the places in the New Testament where you'll find the word mystery. There they are. They're all there. And you'll notice that Matthew 13, 11, the word mystery appears there. What we discussed that, didn't we? That was in terms of a knowledge from the foundation of the world. Yes, God keeps secrets from the foundation of the world and he will reveal them as, as would suit him in conjunction with how Israel works. And Romans 16, there's a passage there. Let's look at that one. So we're going to go to Romans chapter 16 now. Romans 16 and verse 25. You say, why are you taking me to Romans chapter 16 and verse 25? Why is this such a big deal? This is a big deal because some people will say, well, this proves that the mystery that was given to Paul the prisoner, in fact, was given to him in the book of Acts. And that when he, when he talks about it in Ephesians, it's just a recounting of, of what was given in, given in the book of Acts. Now I want you to see that this is, can't be so. It cannot be. Look at Romans 16, verse 25. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began. Also, therefore, that this is the mystery given to Paul, the prisoner. It's the same one. He's just recounting it. It's just the same one. But look at verse 26. But now is made manifest, and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of God, of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. So, what does this mean? Let's have a look at it. Where it says, but now is made manifest, and by the scriptures of the prophet. What does that mean? Well, here's a kind of a, what's, what's a, a leady diagram it's called. It's a, basically a grammatical structure which helps you to think through the passage, basically. So if you, if you basically look at it in Romans uh, 16.25, uh, it says this, and I'll just, just go through it. But to him who has the power to establish us according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to revelation of a mystery. Now, there's the mystery here. This is the word mystery. Do you notice that it does not have what's called a definite article with it? It's not the mystery. We can, we can put the in there just to emphasize our concentration on this particular mystery, but the word that is not in there. And you'll notice something else. See this whole line of construction here? I'm going to sort of enlarge on it. Notice mystery and 
Sesegeminu, and over here, Phenerothentos and Gnorothentos, these all have the same gender, number, and case. They all agree with mystery. So what does that mean? I'll just go through it. Mystery, which has been hid, which has been manifest and made known. Mystery, which has been hid, which has been manifested and made known. Okay? Now, what about this made known? Through scriptures, and then it's got this thing here, which is, an, is actually an adjective. So if you, if you wanted to translate it, through prophetical scriptures. Oh, okay. So it's made known through prophetical scriptures. So this particular mystery, yes, it has been made manifest. Paul got special revelation of it. But he also made it known through prophetical scriptures. Well, my friends, this animal here, the mystery, could never be made known through prophetical scriptures. There is no way you could. And some people would argue, oh no, that just means scriptures written by Paul. No, because these are prophetical scriptures. The nature of these scriptures are that they are prophetical so he's talking about scriptures that in the past, the Old Testament, for example, not anything new. So this is an important thing here, prophetical scriptures. There's one other place where the word prophetical is used, and here it is here in 2 Peter 1.19. We have also a more sure word of prophecy. What is that? It's the prophetical word. And in context, yes, that is to do with Israel, spiritual things, prophetical written in prophetical scriptures. It's a prophetical word. And so what is this mystery that's mentioned in Romans 16? Well, if you look at the structure of Romans uh, chapter 16, uh, and, well, actually the whole of Romans, and you find this mystery, you find it corresponds to the 6th and 7th chapters, which does not mention Abraham, but takes you back to Adam. So the mystery which has been made manifest and also has been made known through the scriptures, prophetical scriptures, is the fact that all people are related to Adam and therefore Israel is out of it. We all have the same need and therefore during this time in the book of Romans, Paul could address the Gentiles and the Jews as equals on the foundation that they're all progeny from Adam and they all have the same need. And that is the mystery that is mentioned in Romans chapter 16. Well, that's very different from what we get in Ephesians. Well, my main message was to be about the mid-Acts cowboys, but I think I've used up all my time. I was going to talk about the mid-Acts cowboys. So we're going to do this next time. We're going to discuss cowboys. Do you like cowboys? With the hat on. Yeehaw! Put these hats on, man. We've, I've even got a cowboy hat back in Oklahoma. I should have brought it, but it would have got all crushed up. So cowboys are interesting characters. Do you think there are cowboys mentioned here in 1 Corinthians? Well, next time we'll discover that in fact there is a lasso mentioned here in the Acts period, and we'll discover some great teaching about the economy. But hopefully today, this has made things more clear to you concerning the economy which is ours versus the economy which is past. Okay, let us pray. Our God and Father, we thank Thee today for the message. We thank Thee for all that's being given to us.